Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing, all right? Good. It is so good to be here. Um, a special welcome to uh, all those who are uh, watching online. We're so glad you could join us. Hope you're enjoying your waffles and pancakes and anything else that you're having this morning. Um, I know that we have a bunch of guys up at the, uh, the Fort Wilderness Men's Retreat. And uh, from what I've heard, that they've been having a great weekend up there. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to be up there next year uh, speaking. And so, guys, if you aren't up there this year, which you aren't because you're here, um, make sure you sign up for next year because we're going to have a blast. It's one of the best men's retreats that there is in the country. And I can tell you, I, I guarantee all they're having this weekend is, is salads. And uh, they're, they're being really healthy up there and being really good. Okay, with that in mind. Um, so a little while ago, I was, uh, I was reading a book and I came across this quote from Father Ted Hesburgh, and uh, he had been the president of Notre Dame for 35 years. And in, 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 in his quote was this. He says, the worst heresy is the belief that one life cannot make a difference. And I think that so often we, we feel that way. I think so often in life we just get overwhelmed. We have this sense of helplessness, of hopelessness. We watch the news and we see what's going on socially and economically and politically and educationally and globally, um, environmentally, and we go, what, what could I do? It's just out of control. The world is, is out of control and there's nothing that I can do. I know I've been there and my guess is you've been there as well. And yet when one looks through the scriptures, when one looks at the, the history of the world, it, you, you begin to see these stories of, of one person after another who truly have made a difference. I think I go back into the, the late 1200s, and there was a man named of William Wallace, and he was fed up with the, the tyranny of the English. And so he went from village to village all over Scotland to lead a revolt and to free the country. And then years later, in the late 1700s, William Wilberforce worked tirelessly in Parliament to help abolish slavery in England. I, I think of a young woman from Albania, and, and she, she moved from Albania to, to the next 20 years, she taught high school geography. And every morning she'd get up and, and she'd walk to school. And when she walked to school, she saw men and women, boys and girls, who were, who were literally dying in the gutters. People who had been rejected by the local hospitals. And her heart started to break for all these people who were dying by themselves, dying without dignity. And so after 20 years of experiencing this, she, she gathered together a lot of her former students and they, they, they developed a, a home for the dying. And, and before her death in 1997, Mother Teresa was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. She had opened up 550 homes around the world for those that were dying. Because she said, I want every person who dies to die in the arms of someone and to die with dignity. I think of a man in the 50s and 60s, Martin Luther King Jr., who, who grew up and witnessed just racial oppression. And, and as, he, as he walked around his neighborhood, he saw the whites-only signs above the water cooler, on the bathroom doors, on the, the restaurant doors. And he says, I can't stand this. I have to do something. And he, and, he, and he gave his life to bring about a, a, a new order, a, a, a country that was characterized by, by, by freedom and justice for all. One person truly can make a difference. Or Bob Pierce. In 1950, Bob was in Asia on a business trip and as he was walking through the city, he saw this long line of orphans waiting for food. And as he was watching this take place, one of the boys in line just fell over and he fell over dead. When he asked what happened, he, they said there wasn't enough food at the beginning of the line. 
And so Bob Pierce flew home to L.A. He gathered some of his more affluent friends, and he started a ministry called World Vision. And World Vision's goal was to provide food, clothing, and education to the poorest of the poor. And since that time, hundreds of millions of boys and girls have been helped. One person. See, the glory of Christianity, my friends, the glory of Christianity is that the simple things do matter. The glory of Christianity is that every single person has dignity and worth in the eyes of God. The glory of Christianity is that everyone can be used by God. And as we continue our series through the book of Colossians this morning, and we get to the last chapter, we're going to look at verses 2 through 6. And what we're going to discover, what Paul's going to talk to us about, is how every one of us, every one of us in this room, no matter what our age, can have an impact in the world. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to to Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. If not, you can just follow along or look up on your phone, look in the Pew Bible, but just get it out because we're just going to walk through this passage. It is one of my absolute favorite passages in all of the scriptures, and we're going to have so much fun with it this morning. Verses 2 through 6, Paul says this. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be always full of grace and seasoned with salt so you may know how to answer everyone. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the incredible privilege it is to gather together as your people. And Father, I thank you now for your word. And I thank you for the principles for life that are found in it. And Father, I pray this morning as we, as we look at Colossians chapter 4, that these would not just be words on a page, but that these would be words spoken from you for us. And so, Father, I pray that through the, 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 the mysterious work of your Holy Spirit, that you would speak to each one of us, that we might leave here today encouraged, comforted, and further equipped to go about the work that you have for each one of us. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. All right. So here are four lessons I want to share with you this morning on what it means for each one of us to have an impact right where we are. Lesson number one, every one of us has a place and a, is, every one of us is in a place and a space for a purpose. Our influence starts right where we are. Right where we are. Notice what Paul says here. He says, pray that God would open a door for the message of Christ. Now, Paul's playing on words here. He's playing on words because where is Paul? Paul's in prison. He's under house arrest, probably in Rome. So he's in prison and he says, pray for me that that God would open the doors for me to, to be effective in my witness for Christ. Notice what he does not say here. He doesn't say, pray that the prison doors are open. No, he's not saying that. What he's saying is, pray that God uses me right in my circumstances. And I think so often our prayers are, God, change my circumstances, because if you change my circumstances, then everything will be okay. If you change my circumstances, then I'll be able to do something. If I, if I could only be married, if I could only, we could only have kids, if I would have a different job, if I lived in a different city, if I had a different home, if I didn't have this sickness, then I could do something. Paul says, no. He says, don't pray that God would change your circumstances. Pray that God would change you in the midst of your circumstances. Pray that you would be effective right where you are. Paul is not praying to be released. Paul's being prayed, is praying to be used by God right where he is. See, the the, the studies tell us 
that every one of us, on average, and I think this is a pretty average group, right? At least from what I see and what, I can, what I've heard, we're all pretty average. As, as average people, we have 154 people in our sphere of influence. Now, how they figure that out, I have no idea. But that's what they tell us. 154 people in our family, extended family, where we go to church, where we go to work, where we go to school, where we go to play at the club or the playground, where, where, when we're out with friends. But on average, every one of us has 154 people. And God says, I have you right there for a unique time, for a unique purpose, that I have you right where I want you. No one is where they are by accident. You are in that classroom, you're in that cubicle, you're in that condo complex, you're in that job, you're in that neighborhood, you're at that club for a purpose. Where does our influence start? It starts right where you are. I can still remember years ago, and uh, we're talking years ago, I was the college-age pastor over at Elmbrook Church for about six or seven years. And every Thanksgiving, we would have a big party on Friday night. It was a chance for all the college students to, that were home for Thanksgiving to get together and just to, to hang out and to catch up with one another. And we usually held it on Friday night. We took over someone's house, and we had 100 students uh, in the house. Matter of fact, this is so cool. Dan and Louise, who you just saw earlier, that uh, our... Um, missionaries in the Philippines, they were in the college age ministry. And I took both of them to the Philippines on their very first trip back in the 80s. But okay, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. So <laughs> anyways, back in, we, we have this party on Friday night. And so um, all these students are there. I normally sit at the kitchen table and I just say, hey, if anyone wants to talk and catch up, just come sit by me. Normally they didn't. But anyways, this, this young girl comes up. She's a freshman. She had just gone to school. She'd been there for six or eight weeks. And she comes up. She goes, Pastor Sonderman, we need to talk. I said, sure. What do you want to talk about? She goes, I have a big decision to make. I said, really? What is it? She goes, I'm thinking of transferring. I go, really? You've only been at Madison for six, six weeks. She goes, I know, but oh, it's really hard. I go, really? She goes, you wouldn't believe what happens at Madison. I go, try me. She goes, <laughs> she goes, you know, they drink there. I go, at Madison? I said, I can't believe this. And she goes, not only that, they do drugs. Not Madison. She goes, and the girls on my dorm floor, they bring their boyfriends home and they sleep over. I can't stand it. I can't handle it. I've got to get out of there. This is such a hard place to be. And I know what she was looking for, but I didn't give it to her. I asked her the question. I said, well, how many other Christ followers are there on your dorm floor? And she goes, none. It's just me and 32 other girls. I go, that is amazing. That's absolutely unbelievable to think that God has entrusted you to that entire dorm floor. <laughs> and she's going, oh, that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> I said, you are there for a purpose. Don't pray to change your circumstances, honey. Just pray to be effective right where God has you. Friends, the most dangerous prayer we can use every single morning is the use me prayer. God, use me. Use me today. Use me to, 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 be, a, to be a salt and light for you right where you have me. God, use me to be loving to the lonely. God, use me to bring healing to the broken. God, use me to bring truth to the confused. God, just use me where I am for your glory and honor. Where does influence start? Paul says influence starts right where you are. And now he moves on. And the second lesson we learn from Paul is that influence involves prayer. Notice what he says here. Look at it. Verse 2, he says, devote yourselves to prayer. The word devote there, it means to be relentless. It means to, to not give up, not to bail out. It means to be persistent. That's what that word devote means. Now, there's not a lot of things that our friends in the South 
Chicago can teach us. But there is one deep spiritual lesson that they can teach us as Bears and Cubs fans. They know devotion. They know their teams are bad. They know their teams will be bad. And it's just futile. But you know what? They still show up. They still go to games thinking something's going to change. That's devotion. And Paul says in a spiritual way, that's the way we approach prayer. Sometimes we don't feel like praying. He says, keep on praying. Sometimes you're not seeing the answers that you want in prayer. He says, keep on praying. He says, sometimes you're not even sure what to pray. You don't, you, you're, you're so broken. You're, things are so hard. You don't even know what to say. And God says, just, just talk with me. See, there's no voice sweeter to our Heavenly Father than the voice of his children. And our God in heaven is ready, willing, and able to hear our prayers. And he loves to hear when we talk to him and use whatever words you want to use, however you want to phrase it. We have a God who does not sleep, who does not slumber, a God who is there and he wants to hear from his children and he wants to release his power into the world. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayers. Friends, prayer, prayer is the front lines, the front lines of, of world evangelization. Prayer is the, the means by which we talk to our commander in chief and we release his power and wisdom into the world. It's, it's, it's what Jesus did. Jesus started his life in prayer his, he continued his life in prayer and he finished his life in prayer and it tells us he even is interceding for us today. Do you know that? That even today, Jesus is praying for us. Prayer was not a part of his life. It was his life. Prayer was not an appendage that he just added on here and there. It was who he was. And that just continued in the book of Acts. The disciples who had watched Jesus and saw him praying they continued that prayer movement because they had seen it in him. When you read the book of Acts, it's a book of prayer. It's a prayer book. That's what the book of Acts is. It says when the, when the early church prayed that the walls shook. It says when the early church prayed that the doors flew open. When, when, the, when the early church prayed, people responded to the message of God's grace and God's love. And they, they, they came after him and went to him. When the early church praised, prayed, life was different, and it's the same today. You say, well, what can I do? What can I do? I'm just an individual person. I'm only 10 years old. I'm 90 years old. I'm a single. I have eight kids. I, what do I do? You pray. Doesn't make any difference how old you are or where you live or what your occupation is, or how many zeros you have in your bank account, every single one of us can pray. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we have a God in heaven who's willing to listen and answer. Years ago, in the 1850s, there was a pastor. His name was Charles Spurgeon. And he was the pastor of the largest church in the world. It was the, the, the London Tabernacle Church. And there were about 10,000 people that showed up at this church every single Sunday. It was amazing, back in the 1850s. And so there was this young couple that got married here in the States, and they, they, they did their honeymoon in London. They took the, the, the ship across the Atlantic, and they got to London. On, on, on midweek, they wanted to go to this church. And they, they walked into the church and it was dark and dingy, and they saw this elderly man just pushing a broom right down the hallway to clean it. And, he, and he, they said, hey, we, we, we want a tour of the church. Could you help us? They said, we want to see where the power is. We want to see where, where people come to Christ, where, where lives are changed. We want to see where the action is. And he said, sure, I'd be glad to show you. And he put his broom down, and they went to a door, and they started walking down into the basement. And they thought, oh, this is weird. We thought we were going into the sanctuary. And then they went down into a sub-basement, and they thought, 
Now they're getting a little freaked out. Like, what's this, who, where's this guy taking us? And then they went down into the sub, sub basement. And they got to the end of the stairs and all there was was this little brown door. And they, they opened the, he opened the door and they literally had to, to, to bend down to get through the door. And they, they, they go through the door and they stand up. And there's the furnace. And they go, oh, that's really nice. That's a nice furnace. And then they looked over here and there was this mountain of coal. They go, oh, that's, that's really nice coal too. Glad we came to London on our honeymoon. And then they, their eyes came down. And when their eyes came down, there were a hundred men and women on their knees praying. And they said, the, the, the elderly gentleman said, this is the power. This is the furnace room. This is where it's happening. Every single day, there are people here praying all day long. And as they pray, things happen upstairs in our sanctuary on Sunday. Oh, by the way, my name is Charles Hayden Spurgeon. I'm so glad to meet you today. Friends, do you have a boiler room? Do you have a furnace room where you go to pray? Do you have a place that you can just get alone, be quiet, and just talk with God? And to take the hearts of your family members and your friends and place them into the hands of a holy God and allow him to work in your life and your life. What's the application? Two applications. Number one, just make a prayer list. Just get a piece of paper or on your phone in your notes section or your iPad or journal, whatever you use, and just start making a list of people you want to pray for. And then, and then just, you know, every day just review it and just begin to pray for others and just pray that God would be working in their life, wherever they're at in their spiritual journey, praying that God would be working in their life. And the second thing you may want to try is just do a prayer walk. Just Walk around your neighborhood and just pray for your neighbors. Take a walk around your, your school and, and, and pray for the classrooms, the teachers, the students. Take a walk around your work and just pray for your, 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 your coworkers. Develop a list and just start taking a prayer walk and just see, begin to see what God is going to do. The third principle that we see in this passage that Paul talks about, he says, we are to live a life consistent with the gospel we represent. Live a life consistent with the gospel we represent. What's Paul saying here? He's saying we are to be the good news before we share the good news. Notice what he says in the passage. Look, look, look at this. He says, here's my prayer. He says, please pray for me. Pray that I'd be wise in the way I act towards outsiders. What's he talking about there? He's talking about his conduct. He's talking about his lifestyle. He's saying, pray for me. Pray for me that I'm here in prison. And as I'm interacting with all these guards and all these other prisoners, pray that the way I live my life would be attractive, that it would point them to Jesus. Pray that as I live my life, I would be an accurate reflection of Jesus to the world, an accurate reflection of Jesus to those in my sphere of influence, that I would reflect the compassion and the grace and the mercy and the kindness and the gentleness and the love of Jesus wherever I go. And then he says, not only that, pray for my speech. He says, pray that my, my speech would be full of grace seasoned with salt. He says, pray that, that when I talk to others, it's not gossip, it's not bitterness, it's not anger, it's not divisive, it's not negative. Pray that as I talk to others, I would be edifying, encouraging, affirming, that I'd be building people up, I'd be, I'd be unifying rather than bringing division. He says, pray for my conduct, pray for my speech, Pray that the life I live would prepare the way for the words that I speak. Because our influence is no more effective than the life that we live. Christians themselves are the greatest argument for Christianity. But they can also be the greatest 
deterrent to Christianity as well. Because our world is watching. Our kids are watching. Our students are watching. Our co-workers are watching. Our friends are watching. And cynicism runs deep in the country today. And what they're looking for is the real deal. Are you authentic? Are you real? Are you being Jesus to the world? A number of years ago, there was a movie. Maybe some of you saw it. I'm not sure I recommend it, but it's a good illustration. Um, it was the movie Jerry Maguire. And the story of Jerry Maguire, it's Tom Cruise, and he's a sports agent. And he represents a wide receiver for the um, uh, Arizona Cardinals. And he, the, 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 the football player does not think his agent, Jerry Maguire, is making him enough money. He thinks he needs to be doing a better job. So there's a, there's a phone call between Jerry Maguire, the agent, and the football player. And it's a, sort of a famous scene. And, and, and so they're talking back and forth. And finally, the, 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 the sports, the, 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 the football player is yelling at Jerry. He's saying, Jerry, Jerry, show me the money. Jerry, show me the money. Don't just talk about it. He says, show me the money. Get me what I deserve. Why do I tell you that illustration? Because, friends, that's what the world is shouting to the church today. Show me your love. Show me your life. Show me. Don't talk about it. Don't sing about it. Don't argue about it. Just show me your life. Show me your love. Show me your compassion. I want to see it in you. That's what they're saying. Where does influence continue? It's with each one of us living a life that's consistent with the gospel we represent. Okay, last point, then we're done. Okay, point lesson number four. Always be prepared to share the hope that's within you. Paul says, pray. Pray that I might be able to proclaim the mystery of Christ. Pray that I'd have open doors. Pray that I'd have opportunities to, 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 to share the hope that's within me, that I might be able to, to, to walk through those open doors and, and share the mystery of Christ. Friends, every one of us has open doors. And every day we can pray and say, God, give us open doors. What's he saying here? He's saying, pray that I would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart ready to respond to those open doors. I can guarantee you this, friends. This Colossians chapter 4, 2 through 6, I pray this almost every morning. On my way to work, I pray this passage. I have prayed this prayer more than any other prayer in the Bible. And I can tell you this, that over the last 45, almost 50 years now of, of following Jesus, that God will answer this prayer. If you pray as you go to school, as you go to work for open doors, God will give you open doors. And you may not, you may not realize it at first, but pray that you'd have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart ready to respond. That open door might be a coworker who is going through a hard time and you say, let's go for coffee. And you just listen. That's the open door. You're just listening as they talk about what's going on in their life. You might go to school tomorrow and you're going to walk into the lunch cafeteria and there's a student sitting all by themselves. And they sit every day by themselves. And the open door is you're just going to go and you're going to sit next to them and ask them about their day. That's an open door. You're going to have a friend who's going to call you at two in the morning because their, their, their wife was just diagnosed with, with breast cancer. And so you're going to get up and you're going to go. And you know what that open door is? It's the open door of presence. You're just going to show up. You don't have to say a whole lot of things. You can hug them. You can cry with them. And you can be there with them. But that's an open door. You have a widow lives on your street. And she struggles to rake the leaves and do her gutters in the fall. And you're going to call up a couple friends and the open door is you're going to go over and you're just going to help her get her yard ready for the winter. That's, that's an open door. 
That's an open door. You're going to have a friend who's, who's just going through a hard time and you're just going to text them a word of encouragement. Hey, Jane, I was thinking about you today. And I just want you to know I'm praying for you. Boom, send. That's an open door. See, the open doors that God gives us to be Jesus to the world are going to be different every single day. But I know this. If you pray that prayer, God, use me. If you pray, God, give me open doors to be Jesus to the world and to talk about Jesus, he will answer that prayer. I guarantee it. And then, he, then we go on in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4, 315. Paul, uh, Peter says this, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that is within you. And so not only do we encourage and affirm and serve and love and demonstrate compassion, but we need to be ready with verbally to answer as well. And I, I think there's two things that every one of us can work on to prepare ourselves for those opportunities. The first is prepared to share our story. Do you know what? Every one of you has a story. Every one of you, as a follower of Jesus, you have a story of God's work in your life. And your story is unique. There is no other story like your story. It's your story. The second thing that's wonderful about your story is no one can argue with it. No one. Because it's what God has done in your life. You can, you can, you can argue about creation versus evolution and are the scriptures, scriptures reliable and, you know, when's Christ coming again? I mean, you can, you can play those games till, you know, till whenever. But you know what? They can't, no one can argue with your story. It's what God has done in your life. And your story is, one of the, is the most powerful tool you have to talk about Jesus. I use my story more than anything else. Conversations, I'm using it all the time. And I'll, I'll, I'll just say, man, I've not been through what you've been through, but I went through something years ago that really dramatically changed my life. Can I just tell you my story? Boom. I just tell my story in just a couple minutes. But every one of us has a story. Can I encourage you as your homework? I'm not going to be here next week to get it, but I'll just honor system <laughs> to just write out your story. Just start. Get a piece of paper. Your life before Christ, how you came to Christ, and your life since coming to Christ. And can I just encourage you to major on what Christ has done in your life since you gave your life to Christ? Focus on that. And then go to your small group in the next couple of weeks, all you small group leaders here, and say, okay, let's have story time. How about we share our stories with one another? Do it in a safe environment. And then the second thing is each one of us, we want to move towards being prepared to share the gospel story as well. The greatest news ever told. It's the good news. It's the best news. It's the greatest news. It's the story of, 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 of Jesus in heaven with the Father, looking down onto mankind and just seeing the brokenness and the hurt and the pain, the disease and the sickness. He saw the way people were treating each other and he said to the Father, Father, I can't stand it. I got to go. And so he left the glory and the splendor and the majesty of heaven and he came to earth. The, the, the miracle of the incarnation is not the distance he traveled. That was nothing. It was the change in environment of coming to live among sinful mankind. And he lived among us for 33 years. And then he went into the garden to pray. And he said, Father, if there is any other way, if you have a plan B for the salvation of the world, could we just talk about that right now? I would really like to know if you have one. And the father said, no, there is no plan B. There's only one plan and it's you. And so Jesus prayed in the garden and said that he, he, the, the prayers were so intense that he began to sweat blood. He said, Father, Father, not, not my will be done, but your will be done. And then he went and they took, gave him a cross and he carried it up a hill called Golgotha. And they put the spikes in his wrists and in his ankles. And then they, they threw him into the ground on that cross. And when he hung there and he bled there and he died, he was saying to the world, I love you. He took your place and my place. And then they threw him into the grave. And the evil one, 
The evil one thought he had won. He thought it was over. But heaven was counting one, two, three. And on day three, he rose from the dead. And he conquered sin. He conquered death once and for all. And now the risen Lord Jesus, yet seated in heaven, desires to have a relationship with each one of us where he can give us a sense of purpose and significance and worth and dignity. And he gives us life. Life. The resurrected life. That's the gospel story. There's many ways to tell the story. Many ways to explain it to a friend or a family member. But I, may I encourage each one of you, in your own words, in your own way, begin to learn the story of Jesus coming and saying to the disciples, follow me. That's it. Follow me. And they drop their nets and they follow Jesus. That's the story. That's the story we want to tell. It's not the story of a church or the story of a denomination. It's the story of Jesus and wholehearted devotion to him. Okay, so what does it look like? Let me tell you a final story. Let me, I'll, I'll wrap this up and then we'll sing our song. It's the story of one of the greatest baseball players ever. His name was Mickey Mantle. Mickey Mantle played for the New York Yankees. His friends called him the Mick. He played for the Yankees for 14 years. 12 of those years, he went to the World Series. Not bad career. Three MVP awards, the coveted Triple Crown. 1969, he was awarded the Hall of Fame. He was voted into the Hall of Fame. Not only was he one of the greatest players to ever play the game, but he also partied hard as well. Mickey Mantle, great, great player, but he was a womanizer and an alcoholic. His wife and four kids all left him because of his alcoholism. Years later, as he, well, while he was a player, there was another player in that clubhouse. His name was Bobby Richardson. And Bobby Richardson was a, was a Christ follower. And for 11 years, as when they played together, Bobby would often go over to Mickey and talk to him before or after a game. And he would just try to encourage him and try to help him to get off of alcohol and just to help him with his life. And in those times, he would regularly tell him about Jesus and about grace and forgiveness and God's love for him. But Mickey Mantle just constantly rejected it. He ridiculed him. He made fun of him. And Bobby at night would go home and just say, why am I here? Why am I on the Yankees? What am I doing in that clubhouse? Can I do anything? And years later, in 1995, Bobby received a phone call from Mickey Mantle. And he said, this is Mickey. I'm on my deathbed and I'd like to visit with you. And so Bobby made the trip, and they went, he went into the hospital and went into Mickey's room. And when he walked in, Mickey was just bawling. And Bobby said, Mick, what can I do for you? He said, Bobby, I'm about to die, but I want you to know this, that all, I want to apologize to you for all the times I scoffed at you, I ridiculed you, I rejected you, I didn't listen to you, I am so sorry. I want you to know that the seeds that you planted 30-some years ago took root. And I want you to know that days ago, I gave my life to Jesus. And I'm going to follow him for the hours and days I have left in this life. He said, my favorite verse now is John 3.16. For God so loves the world that he sent his only son, that whoever believes in him will have eternal life. He said, Bobby, Bobby, I believe it. It's true. And I'm going to have eternal life with Jesus. Friends, every one of us has a Mickey in our life. No one is too far from God. You might feel like you're not in the right place. You might not think you're in the right school or in the right neighborhood or in the right job, but you are. And God has us in a, a place and a space for a purpose. And he 
will use us there. Let's pray. Just we're gonna we're gonna sing a song as the band comes up. Though, would you please stand? And here's what we're gonna do. I'm just gonna we're just gonna just stand up. Yeah, right where you are. Just just stand up. Don't worry. You don't have to come forward or anything. Just just stand. We're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray Colossians. I'm gonna pray Colossians four over you right over for us right now. Devote Meadowbrook. Devote yourselves to prayer being watchful and thankful. We pray for each one of us that this week that God would open a door for the message, that we might proclaim the mystery of Christ. I pray that we may proclaim it clearly as we should. Father, help us to be wise in the way we act towards outsiders. Help us to make the most of every opportunity that you give us. Father, help us this week that our conversations would be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that we may know how to answer everyone we come in contact with. In Jesus' name, amen.